do you have to learn to draw before you can start painting? In this video, I'll be answering that question and a few others asked by my subscribers. So this is an Ask Me Anything video and I'm going to be answering some of the questions that I've been asked both by subscribers of this channel and also from members of my Facebook group. If you haven't joined my Facebook group yet, it's completely free. It's a very welcoming and kind space. You'll find a link in the video description. So let's jump in to our first question. So let's do our first question. I won't clickbait you. I'll do the one that I spoke about at the beginning of the video. So Liz says, I tend to paint very tight, but I would like to paint looser and more abstract and more ethereal suggestions. And she also says, I've learned so much from you. Thank you for everything, which is very kind of you to say, Liz. Now let's think about this question. And I'm actually going to do a video about how to find your painting style, because this is something that so many people ask about. And so many people have this idea that they want to paint loosely. And that's because loose watercolors are really, really very beautiful. But I want you actually to consider the practicalities of if it's right for you to paint loosely. I would love to be a loose painter, but I'm absolutely not. Why I thought when I started out that I was somebody that would paint in a loose, splashy manner when I literally fold my socks and label my pasta jars is beyond me. So your painting style has much to do with your personality. And I want you to think that just because you admire something, unfortunately, it may not be the thing that's right for you. I admire very big, chunky jewellery. And as you can see, if you watch some of my early videos on this channel, it doesn't always look that great on me because I'm extremely small. And so we have this idea of admiring things, of admiring fashion, of admiring perhaps a minimalist apartment when you've got four kids and five dogs. It's extremely hard to know if something is right for you or if you just admire it. So there are things that you can do to paint more loosely. One of the things you can do actually is to change mediums. I don't mean permanently, perhaps you love watercolors, but a couple of mediums that will force you to work a bit more loosely are soft pastels and also pen and wash, because what you can do is you can put the pen down and then you can throw the watercolors on top very loosely and very splashily. And this can help to loosen up your painting a little bit, but you should never be aiming to find a style that's completely different from the one which you naturally find yourself painting in. Remember, there's a difference between work that's too tight and work that is perhaps botanical. If you've ever looked at really beautiful botanical painting, you've never thought to yourself, oh, that's a bit tight. You've thought, well, that's really beautiful. So there's a difference between tight and detailed. It may be that you are meant to be a detailed painter. Of course, you can have some kind of artifice where you can draw someone else's style in and someone else's methods. You can make yourself paint loosely, but it's never going to be as successful as if you sort of look within yourself and find the style that you are most naturally drawn to. And one thing I always say is that you don't need to find your style. Your style will find you. And unfortunately, you don't always get to choose it. Just keep painting and eventually you will find a style and it's fine to want to paint a little bit more loosely, but try not to inflict some other style on top of your own. It would be like me waking up tomorrow and say, I would love to have blue eyes when I've got sludgy green eyes. It's not going to happen. I could wear blue contact lenses, but I'd never really look very good because I wasn't meant to have blue eyes. So it's important that you let your painting style embrace your own nature. So a question now from MZ Candy 94 Do you use any other mediums such as oils, acrylics, etc. from a fellow watercolour enthusiast says they love my videos? Well, thank you very much. Yes, I do use lots of other mediums. Um, so the thing that I did the most actually when I first started out was printmaking. So I've done a lot of traditional printmaking, particularly mono printing and indeed lino printing. I've also done a lot of mosaic work. I'll try and put some pictures up here. YouTube tends to put people in a box. Unfortunately, if I go into other mediums, then those videos just don't do as well. So yes, I have and do uh, paint in acrylics. I haven't done a lot of acrylics, so I'd like to do more. Watercolor is definitely my absolute favorite. I've also used soft pastels, I've used oil pastels, I've used pen and wash. The only thing I haven't done is oils. I did years and years ago get myself some water soluble oil paints. And I find that actually 
I am somebody who is naturally quite neat and I found that I painted so neatly with oils it was almost photorealism. I didn't really like the results I got. I'd love to try it again someday actually. I think I'd probably do better at it now I'm a bit more of an experienced painter. But yes, I do work in other mediums. I actually want to get back to making mosaics again fairly soon. I use a technique called pique a which is French. It means something like stolen plate or picked plate. And it's mosaic where you just grab random broken objects and make mosaics out of them rather than buying sort of ready-made little cut tiles. If you have a ferret around on this channel, there's a few mixed media videos and you will find, I think I've got one or two acrylics videos. I'm also starting to paint a lot more in gouache now which of course is a type of watercolour too. Really interested to know what sort of videos you'd like me to put on this channel if there are any other mediums that you're interested in. Watercolour will always be my first love but I do often use it in a sort of a mixed media way and I do often bring other things in. I particularly bring in watercolour pencils so watercolour pencils are something that I almost never use alone but I often use in my watercolour paintings. So I hope that's answered the question. So a difficult question from Teresa here. Teresa says, I'm wondering how you achieve your saturated colour technique while still retaining realism and just slightly coming to the edge of surrealism. You are so talented. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, my, my style has just kind of evolved. And once I stopped trying to force myself into other ways of painting and really began sort of thinking what I was attracted to, which was really sort of pattern and colour, became much easier for me. Now, as for saturated colour, just need to use more paint. Um, I do advise using tube paints. Now, there's nothing wrong with pan paints and you can use them in conjunction, but if you've got a large area and you want really saturated colour with watercolours, you're going to need some tube paints too because you simply can't get enough pigment on the paper with certain colours just by using pan paints alone. So that would be my first recommendation. And the thing with the surrealism is I've just allowed myself to trust my instincts. So I was painting, um, I'll try and put a picture up, but I was painting um, some plants and I just had this sudden desire to put red in the background, just flat red colour in the background. And sometimes I do just have a desire to, you know, add a certain pattern or to add some spots. So it's really about just allowing your instincts to take over and not being afraid that you're going to ruin the painting. Of course, you may ruin the painting, but if you don't take any risks, then you never start developing that style of your own. So that's what I do now. And I try and trust my instincts. And if I have a real strong instinct just to do something crazy on the paper, it's just a piece of paper, I give it a go. So Delphine asks, how did my family support my artistic efforts growing up? So this is a really hard question for me to answer, actually, because the truth is they didn't really. I did not have a great childhood. There were artists on my father's side of the family, but as mostly I was just told, you know, it's not a good way to make a living. My parents split when I was very young. I had a very disrupted childhood. I was dragged here, there and everywhere. I'm not saying that nobody ever patted me on the back and said, nice drawing. But honestly, my upbringing was so chaotic. I don't know that people even really noticed that I was drawing and painting a lot. And even if they had, it wouldn't have been considered in my family as something particularly wonderful because most of my father's side of the family can paint. I have been estranged from my father for many, many decades. And this is not something that I plan on changing. I have a good relationship with my mother, but she has no interest whatsoever in art. She's not an arty person. She likes doing things like Sudoku puzzles and she's good at maths. So this is something that, you know, we can't relate to each other in this way. I do have a much longer video on this channel. I think it's called Why I Stopped Painting for 10 Years. But I do feel that in the end, you have to leave your childhood behind and you have to leave any bad things that happen to you behind. And none of us can guarantee that we're going to have encouragement from anybody else. So my main point to this answer is be your own encouragement. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day if anybody else believes that you can do something or if anybody else notices that you're good or bad at something. Just do what you want to do. So Otter Wench says to me, what would you recommend for a beginner? Absolute basics in terms of, you know, paper, brushes and paint. 
Now I have videos all about this, so I'm gonna try and find one of my videos where I go through the absolute basic things that you will need as a beginner. I'll put a link to that video in the description of this video because I can answer your question in much more depth in that way. This next question is a really long one, so I'm gonna to have to look down while I read. So Sierra November Kilo, good username, says, I've asked other artists, no real answer, so would be interested if you have guidance on how to hold and manipulate various tools, i.e. paintbrushes, pencils, fine liner pens, etc., to do the different tasks. I feel there is a different center of balance and hold for each that may be different, hence why we gravitate to a particular medium because we have a particular way of holding or manipulating the tool. Also why some people think they're no good at art because they have a fixed holding style suited to other tasks, e.g. handwriting. I think that's such an interesting idea. It's not something I can give you a comprehensive answer on because everybody's different. Everybody's physiology is different. Now, there's a lady who used to come to my painting classes who had very, very severe arthritis to the point where her hand was you know, pretty much stuck in a claw shape. And yet she used to produce some really good work. Now, there's one YouTuber that I watch who's a very, very good pencil artist. And when I look at how she holds the pencil, I'm going to grab a pen here just because it's all I've got. She holds the pencil like this. And I just think, how on earth? And the work is absolutely beautiful. Now, when I picked up a paintbrush, I tended to hold it, and I still do hold it, as if I'm holding a pen to write, which is perhaps why I have such a detailed style. Many oil painters, because with an oil painting, you need to be further back usually. Many oil painters who hold longer brushes will hold them at the end like this and work like this. So I think it's something that you shouldn't get too hung up on. Really, at the end of the day, as the lady who sort of clasps her pencil with a fist has proved, the way you hold your paintbrush or your writing tool may not really be indicative of how good or how bad your work is. I personally would only explore changing the way you hold a tool if you're just not happy with your results. And then you can perhaps see if changing the way that you hold that particular tool or brush will help you. So it really is fascinating, but I've never made a video where I've told people how to hold a paintbrush. Some people do this, but I think it's probably much better to hold a brush in a way that is just instinctive and natural to you. Yes, that may change the way you paint. You may not paint the same as me because you are holding a brush differently to me. But then isn't that the point of art that we all produce something different? So the next question, and I'm not going to give you the name of the person because I've just got a username here that's um, full of random letters and numbers. But anyway, they have asked me, do you find it harder to work from a photo than painting on plain air? Any advice? Actually, I think it's much easier to work from a photograph. Now, photos do have certain disadvantages. Things like perspective and colour can be warped or washed out. So you do have to be careful of photos. And I may do a longer video about this. But when you're looking at a photograph, particularly if you're painting something like buildings, when you look at that photograph, the perspective point is fixed. Now, if you're working in real life, you only have to move your head or your body from one side to the other or get up and sit down in a different place. And you are looking at a completely different perspective view. The same goes when you're actually, you know, painting something like a still life that's on the table in front of you. You've got to be very careful. I often used to walk around classes where I was teaching still life and I would see people sort of and they'd have, you know, vases or whatever in front of them and they'd be peering around like this to try and see the thing. they could. And I was just like, don't do that because you're going to be working from two different points of perspective. Now, when you work from a photograph, the perspective is fixed where the photographer took that photograph from. So you may be sitting at your desk low down, but if the photographer took the photograph from up high, that is the viewpoint that you have. You then have the photographer's viewpoint. And no matter what you do with that photograph, you move it around your desk, you get up, you have a cup of tea, you come and sit down, you've still got the same point of perspective. So from the point of view of accuracy, uh, working from photographs can be better. For me personally, I have that Reynolds thing where your fingers go numb. And I live in England, so it's cold most of the time. So for me, painting outdoors is not something that I find easy. There's all sorts of practical difficulties. The sun moves a lot. You've also got things like insects bothering you. So for me, I'd much rather be painting from a photograph. But you do have to take photographs with a pinch of salt, particularly when it comes to colour. And understand that colour may wash out, especially with skies. I saw so many people 
in my art class, he would come in with a landscape photograph they'd taken. And if it was sort of a fairly gray day, the photograph had been taken and the sky was literally white and they would start painting it like this. And I would say, you know, perhaps put a little bit of color in your sky. So yes, photographs have limitations, but overall, I think as a beginner, it's certainly easier to work from a photograph. So I have a question now from username Brighton Rosie. Rosie, do you actually live in Brighton in the UK? Because um, my friend Farah lives there and I visit sometimes. Right, so we have a question on perspective on buildings. When there is a step down, say from garden path to pavement, how do you stop it looking flat? And if something is jutting out from a building, such as a shop awning, how do you work out the angles for that? So two questions there. Now, the main thing with steps is you get this very definite sort of light and dark effect. And you may have seen it, if you've seen those quilts where they sort of do the tumbling blocks, and everything's flat, but they've made it look three dimensional with the darks and the lights. That's something that you can do with stairs very easily. So what you want to do is, um, even if it's not very visible on your photograph, you want to make the top of the steps light and then the bit where the step drops down or the side of the steps, you want to make that darker and you'll get very much more of a three dimensional view that way. When it comes to things that stick out from buildings that almost seem to be separate from the building perspective, of course, they've got their own perspective. Rather than try and sort of, you know, mathematically work that out, I like to just lay something on the uh, on the photograph you're working from, or if you're working from real life, just to hold up, you know, hold up your pencil or pen and just sort of, you know, line it up like that and just look at the angle and transfer it across. It's much easier to do that than to try and work out, you know, 20 different multiple points of perspective on buildings. If you've got something like I'm thinking of those um, buildings in sort of Italy and Malta where you have all the balconies on the outside, it can be really difficult because not only have you got this perspective of this thing that's sticking out from the building, they're not all the same because as you go up or, you know, as you go away, the perspective on each one is going to change. Now, they do certainly follow lines of perspective and you can plot them. But um, actually, really just a little bit of a hack is that if you just draw things accurately, the perspective is always correct. So I would just take a long object, something like a pencil or a ruler and lay it on that object. You can actually, if you put the photograph near your painting, you can actually sort of put it there and sort of slide it across. It's not exact, but it'll give you a good enough angle. And that's the way that I would work it out. And if you're looking at something in real life, then you want to hold up your pen or pencil to get the angle. Remember as well to keep your arm straight like so, and that'll help you to figure it out. So before we go, uh, let's just laugh at some trolls again. Now, one of the things that I get the most hate about is indeed my nails, and particularly when they're green like this. These are actually done to match my car at the moment. So um, this color here is the color of my car. If you don't believe me, I'll put a picture up. When I first got my car, I thought to myself, hmm, am I gonna regret this? Because so many cars nowadays are just black, white, or silver. And I have to say, every single time I look at my bright green frog colored car, it makes me beyond happy. But a lot of people don't like it when my nails are green or indeed any bright color. Some of them say that it's so distracting they can't concentrate on the art. Um, to that, I would really say, you know, maybe don't cross the road unaccompanied. And I'll always take constructive criticism, but as far as I'm concerned, the way I look is off limits. I'm well over 50 now. This is not a fashion channel. This is an art channel. You're just going to have to put up with my nails and I'm going to keep painting them different colours. So do let me know in the comments if you have any other questions for me and um, if you have an opinion on my green nails, you're welcome to leave it, but keep it polite because I do have a block button. And before you leave this video, don't forget to have a look in the video description because I've got loads of free stuff down there for you. I've got some free downloadable PDFs. I've even got some free courses that you can take. I'll also put up one of my most popular videos for you to watch right now.